And welcome everyone to this webinar of discuss and discussion of a report, I think that has been done for the first time in Singapore, and, and which I hope will be done again in the future because it provides in some ways reassuringly familiar stories about uh, academia and, and freedom in Singapore. So in that 40 page report that was circulated, uh, there's a lot to discuss. So I would rather keep my comment very short for now and then pass on to the other three panelists. Uh, some people will have read that said the survey received only about 10% uh, of the responses, which is not bad at all for an online survey. So I think the, the stories and the views would chime with somebody who is familiar with developments in academia in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, so I look forward to the panelists' discussion uh, points on the, uh, on the substance of the report before chiming in and continuing with the discussions. Okay, can I now call on the Linda, my favorite and longtime co-conspirator, uh, co-writer on many things, uh, to give us her comments on, um, on the report. Linda. Okay, thank you, uh, Corinne Engfong. Yeah, I think the report was in equal parts reassuring and concerning. It's reassuring because well over 90% of the respondents said that they believe in the principles and practices of academic freedom. A majority said they had not personally experienced restrictions uh, on their research or teaching. And one uh, senior faculty member even is quoted as saying that he or she thinks that things are better than they were in the 1980s and 1990s, I think. Um, what was concerning to me was the large proportion, I don't know, 55% or what, who said that they had to uh, seek permission to invite speakers uh, and to speak to the media. Uh, I don't recall this happening in the 1970s and 1980s when I was a graduate student and then a research fellow hanging around the University of Singapore, but Eng Fong would be better placed uh, to explain that it seemed to me in general, there was less bureaucratic uh, intervention in those days and the media for which uh, Eng Fong and I wrote a lot um, was definitely more free then. So I'm not sure how we would, whether we, whether it's entirely true that things are better depends on your starting point. Uh, also disturbing was the fact that uh, people said they felt that they were discouraged from civic uh, engagement with civil society, which is both a right and a responsibility of academics, particularly those uh, at public institutions like ourselves. So, uh, you know, to discourage people from participating, uh, to speaking to the media or participating in civil society is antithetical to the values and mission of a public a university. Uh, that's why we use the term ivory tower in a derogatory sense, right? If you're all closeted away in your ivory tower, then you're really not being a good, um, uh, academic. So at, at my university, for example, um, we not only tolerate, but encourage and even incentivize people to get engaged uh, in the community, in national life, and to write for the media. You have to report all these activities in your faculty annual report. Um, there are honors and awards given to people who are strong social um, contributors. The communications departments refer media to you for commentary. They help you edit and place your opinion pieces. And, uh, you know, all this is countered and publicized and so on. So that to me was very surprising. Um, uh, well, not maybe not surprising, but uh, disturbing. I did find it interesting that there was no difference, uh, statistically significant difference between uh, locals and foreign faculty, about 
who are about equally represented in, among survey responders with respect to um, academic freedom. You know, uh, ac academia is a small world and from time to time, Singapore is a small place, and from time to time, people would contact me, including people I don't know, to who are being headhunted usually to some university in Singapore and they want my opinion and so on. And I developed this line, which was, if you're not a Singaporean and you don't study Singapore, you're fine with respect to academic freedom. Uh, we all know foreigners who study Singapore who've had their EP and PR uh, rescinded uh, and so on. But more recently, one has heard cases of foreigners, foreign faculty in Singapore who do not study Singapore, who have been having difficulty with their visas and so on. One um, I know in particular, uh, and it wasn't he who told me, it was somebody else, uh, that he was actually uh, given an offer, a full professor tenured offer at one of the universities. And then it was rescinded when it went above the president. Okay? Nobody knows how or why. He did not study Singapore. And uh, I was asked about this by another uh, foreign faculty who was being recruited for a similar position at that same university. He didn't come. I don't know whether that was the reason uh, or not. So I don't feel comfortable saying as I used to that if you're not Singaporean and you don't study Singapore, you're not a threat. So you know, you're, you're perfectly uh, free. I do concur with the survey respondents that what you study matters. Okay, uh, quite a few people said that if their work was politically sensitive, I think you are more likely to encounter restrictions um, or at least cautions from colleagues and superiors to say, you know, better be careful. <laughs> this better be careful is saying like everybody hears, nobody really knows what it refers to, uh, but you're supposed to, to you know, internalize that, and that's where self-censorship uh, comes from. I think it's sad because, um, and it's not good for the country, because something that's politically sensitive is likely to be for an issue which is uh, controversial, uh, perhaps disagreement with government policies. And if you don't engage independent scholarly experts, you're much less likely to get to uh, an optimal solution. To a large extent, the job of an academic is to challenge the status quo. Otherwise, humanity would never have pro progressed, right? So we're always looking for new interpretations and um, alternative uh, solutions. So I think it's, it's a real loss to everyone if people who are in or feel they are in some politically sensitive territory observe some hidden OB markers or red lines uh, and then uh, we're all the poorer for that. So those are my um, initial comments. I'm done, Ing Pong. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. Now we move on to uh, Walter. Hey, thanks, thanks for, um, and also thanks, Linda, for sharing your views earlier. I'm going to share screen, so um, this is the point where you tell me if I've got a problem and nobody can see what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> can I? Huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, so I, I'm going to start by telling you that something funny happened to me on the way to the Agora, right? Which is that <laughs> I, I, I accepted this uh, invitation a couple of weeks ago from Charian. And, you know, I thought nothing more of it, right? And right after the email blast went out, I got two different people, also from academia broadly defined, who uh, basically, you know, like uh, communicated with me and they told me, hey, are you sure you're doing uh, something that is wise being on this panel? And of course, you, you know where they're going with this, right? Uh, and the thing is, they had no idea what I was going to say. Uh, and I was just going to be a panelist, right? I didn't author the study or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with the study, right? Uh, and I was also inclined to believe that, um, I mean, you know, um, look, why would people prejudge me based purely on whether my name appears on this panel or not? But clearly that view I had was incorrect. Uh, clearly there are people who are willing to prejudge me based on just being linked to this panel in academia.sg. And I would imagine the pressure on junior academics, uh, more junior academics, uh, would be a lot worse, right? Um, but anyway, be that as it may, um, I think participation in these kinds of things is very important because 
I think it's through these events that the concept of academic freedom actually gets defined in practice, right? And what I'm going to say here is that I think, um, and, and this is something that I think I can take away from the survey, which is that um, academic freedom, I think, really has to be a negotiated or contested consensus. Uh, by that, I mean that we shouldn't have this impression, which I think sometimes it may be the impression some of us have, right? Which is that academic freedom is all about uh, some powerful entity. Okay, Maybe it's the faculty leadership, maybe it's the state, whoever it is, right? Uh, or maybe it's a transnational group of scholars. Okay, so, so they define what academic freedom is, they give it to you and everything is solved, right? And I mean, of course, as academics, we are trained somewhere. Uh, different places vary in how they construe academic freedom. And we're going to take reference to these definitions. But I think ultimately, it's our actions in the context we find ourselves in in Singapore. That's what determines the limits, users, and the broader purpose of academic freedom. And I think that's the first issue um, with what this survey is revealing. Because if you think about the survey as a self-portrait, of the actions that academics in Singapore take to negotiate or contest what academic freedom is, I don't think it's a good self-portrait self at all. Why is it not a great self-portrait? Because I think there are a couple of major points I took away. First, I think there's a preference among faculty leadership. Now, I don't think uh, many of them answered the survey directly. So really, I would say this is an inference from uh, the experiences that people who did respond to the survey have gone through. But there seems to be a preference, which maybe is longstanding, to avoid public tests or negotiation on what the limits of academic freedom actually mean in practice in Singapore. So that's one. Second, while there is widespread support for internationally defined definitions of academic freedom, so most people seem to agree with these uh, boilerplate statements of what it is, and there's also a lot of opposition to any sort of hypothetical act that might suggest intervention or constraints on these rights, right? Especially the right to engage in politically and socially, um, perhaps controversial <laughs> teaching and research. Um, you know, at the same time, people don't want to contend, right? People don't want to negotiate, people don't want to test what the limits of academic freedom are. And there's a significant minority who are implicitly or explicitly avoiding research and you know teaching that might possibly entail such a test. And people pay a lot of attention to what the prevailing context is from faculty leadership and peers that you shouldn't be doing these tests in Singapore if you could and could know what's good for you, right? <laughs> Not anybody said that, but yeah, that's what it is. And I think uh, the most striking finding for me is actually not from the survey answers, it's from the 10% response rate, right? Uh, the most concerning implication for me is most academics contacted just don't think it's worth their time to actually even engage in a minimal level on this topic, answering the survey, right? And I think that's a bigger concern to me than, than the possibility that people don't see it as a safe space. I think apathy is actually a lot worse because you, you cannot possibly come to any sort of community consensus test and negotiation if people just don't care about it, okay? All right, so then a couple of other points. Do the, save, do the survey results represent reality, opinion, or something in between? So this is like the Rashomon effect, right? Should we interpret this as uh, about facts and academic freedom, opinions or opinions on facts? And my view is um, there are substantial portions of the survey which are more like opinions and facts than anything else. Okay, so, so what do I mean? Here's a fact, right? A fact would be a certain percentage of faculty appointments are affected by non-academic interference. The opinion is, what is that percentage? Does anybody know what it is? Well, we all have opinions or views on that, right? Some people think it's zero, some people might think 10%, whatever it might be. And when I look at some segments of the survey, like the, the VDEM five question set, uh, perceptions in the general environment, we know that research in other contexts, right, shows that when people answer questions about politically or socially salient facts, for example, uh, what percentage of migrants do you think are on welfare, right, that's very socially salient. Well, responses are often systematically biased, and I think academics may not be immune from that either. So let me give you a very good example of this. We've got this question which asks people about um, campus integrity, right, in the VDEM set. And um, Look, 10% of the respondents believe that campus integrity in Singapore is fundamentally or to a large extent undermined by surveillance and intimidation, including, quote unquote, violence or closures is in the text of the question itself. And ultimately, there is a fact somewhere here, right? The fact is, did an incident in recent years occur of extensive surveillance, severe intimidation, including violence or closures on Singapore campus? My opinion on the fact is none. 
no such event happened in the recent years, but 10% of respondents don't agree with me, right? So assuming that we share the same reality, something happened and some academics interpreted that fundamentally different from how I interpreted it, right? Um, but what's the broader issue here? The broader issue is we don't have a public discussion among academics on these events, and we don't have any idea what our individual and collective responses to them are. And if we don't do something about this, if we don't um, talk about these events as comfortable as they may be, even for ourselves as well as for you know, other stakeholders, the real problem I think is that it just encourages polarization of our views and what is really going on here, right? It reduces our prospects of coming to any sort of reasonable consensus or at least idea of what academic freedom uh, really means in our context. Okay, so um, just a couple more things. Um, you know, there are strong readings of academic freedom. When you look at some of these um, boilerplate international statements on it, you have these conventional notions which are about the right of academics to pursue research and teaching without interference from non-academic sources. And the justification for this is social interests are furthered the best by, you know, the ability of academics to discover the truth, right? Determined, of course, by scientific standards. But of course, there's a, there's a paradox in an extreme reading of this statement. I'm certainly not the first one to point this out, right? Uh, the really extreme reading is society's interests are furthered by active rejection of attempts from non-academic parts of society to shape, guide, or interfere with academic freedom. And the real problem is why would academics like us claim to be the best interpreters of the broader social interest. I mean, a lot of us are not well equipped to perform this task in isolation from the broader community. So that's why my sense is um, we cannot walk away or run away from this idea that academic freedom has to be well, justified by the welfare of society, but also that, that notion of what is the welfare of society has to be negotiated, tested, or practiced between academics and non-academic stakeholders, right? We can't say that uh, any attempt by non-academic stakeholders to tell us what dating academics should or shouldn't be doing is automatically an assault on academic freedom. Sometimes it is, but other times it's just their attempt as well to tell us that something is not in the interest of society as they see it, and we need to talk about why that is the case. Okay, And we also need to confront the fact that academic stakeholders themselves are not necessarily um, sometimes unself-interested upholders of the notion of academic freedom, right? Because after all, um, academic freedom also means not just being free to teach and research, but also having a roof over your head, being able to feed your family, right? Uh, not just freedom from violence, for example. And there is a lot of evidence, I think, that indicates the academic community itself constructs this notion of freedom in a very limited and self-interested way. Uh, as an economist, there are lots of types of economic research for which there are no jobs available in academia because they are not consistent with the dominant neoclassical paradigm. I mean, I belong to the paradigm and I know very well you can't get a job outside of it in most universities. And then if you think about what that implies, uh, you know, you really have to question how different that is from restrictions imposed by stakeholders to government or whoever they may be to not hire or support academics who are working in things which the stakeholders don't want. Because academics themselves have plenty of ideas about what they don't want other academics to be doing research in, right? So um, yeah, so, so I think that's a big problem. The interaction of academic gatekeeping with these other stakeholder pressures if you don't think about that critically and check it, it tends towards a version of academic freedom, which is really quite grotesque, right? It's going to be academically self-serving research that also doesn't challenge any conventional narrative. So, and that's also going to be a, a very big problem. Okay, so then just uh, some closing remarks here. So I suppose uh, the question might be, what's the value of all of this anyway, right? I, and this is really trying to talk about the value to broader society rather than to academics whom I presume are convinced by this. And I'm never one to waste a really bad crisis. So uh, let's look at what the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, this is the US government body who was supposed to report on what was or wasn't happening in Afghanistan. This is what they reported, right? So they reported widespread divergence between what the US military wished to believe about success in building Afghan armed forces and what was actually going on in the ground. And the story here is very familiar to anybody who has studied or understands bureaucratic processes. Obviously, people want to portray or tell a good story about what's going on to the senior leadership, and they will systematically favor reports that are favorable 
and suppress, deny, reject, uh, ostracize reports which are not favorable, right? And it's very likely that this kind of pattern of uh, self-denial uh, or rather like, you know, rejection of the truth is in part responsible for the massive miscalculation that unfortunately uh, the United States and other countries did in pulling out of Afghanistan. And this is what you see the result to be now, okay? So, you know, that's really the problem, I think, with apathy and academic freedom in Singapore. Uh, policymakers would have a very strong interest in believing that these concerns, these debates we're having, and widespread apathy by faculty on academic freedom have got nothing to do with the quality of education and teaching in Singapore. And I think that assessment is going to be problematic, especially in social sciences. Uh, because what's going on is that it means research on non-Singapore issues, especially if you can publish it in nice international journals, well, you prioritize that. There are no academic freedom concerns, as Linda alluded to, right? And research on Singapore issues is not only unincentivized, but it becomes subject to maybe unintentional bias, which is that if you are doing scholarship and research uh, and, and teaching that perpetuates our status quo and the narratives that uh, stakeholders like to hear, okay, then you'll find it very easy. You get funding, you get access to data, research subjects, teaching materials, but do you really have an incentive to make it very sharp, right? And you can, you know, can you actually get a way of doing less than your best work on doing that? And the answer is maybe you can, because who's really going to question that very much, right? But um, if you want to challenge the status quo and the teams and the interests of uh, important stakeholders in Singapore, right? It's going to need to be a lot sharper and more robust to survive the pushback. And people aren't going to want to do it, right? There's going to be a lot less quantity, uh, even if the quality of what remains might be better than average. And I think that's the, the biggest concern here, that we don't end up deluding ourselves the same way that the Americans did about Afghanistan. Okay, so uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Walter. You want to take comments now or you want uh, questions now, or should we wait for the next speaker? Uh, uh, that's up to you, Ang Fong. Yeah. yeah, look, you know, you've been around and the academia on one side, public uh, stakeholders, including the government on the other side, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, we have evolved a way of behaving towards each other. And uh, for reason for self-constraint, uh, constraints by authorities or by, um, and untransparent rules and, and, and behavior on the part of the public uh, stakeholders have made it very difficult. It's a guessing game. But as, as you correctly pointed out, there has been negotiated between the, the, the side that has much more power than the academia. The academia shrink away because for career and other reasons, uh, they think it's a, it's a safer route uh, to staying employed. So to what extent do you think greater government transparency would help in engaging academia and academia's better understanding of the kind of role that the that the, that the public sector, that the government has to play because, you know, it, because it, they have to emphasize community national interests, whereas, uh, whereas academic by nature and by trading tend to be contrarian, tend to, uh, to, to, to raise issues which are interesting but not necessarily important. So what do you think? Do we need a better way of engaging? How do we even go about doing this? when everybody has been now trained to behave in a particular way, both on the public side as well as on, in academia. So I, I guess the, the starting point is that, um, I mean, I, I think one, one of the ideas I try to develop is that we're not going to get very far by waiting for some magical redefinition of what academic freedom is or shouldn't be, you know, in Singapore to drop from some minister of education's mouth, right? I mean, uh, it's not something that, as we know, they prefer to do unless they are actually forced to by events such as, uh, you, you know, the Yale and US uh, issue with Alfian Sat last uh, two years ago, yeah. I mean, those kinds of events precipitate some kind of policy statement, but otherwise, why bother talking about it, right? But, but, um, and then also, I think it's important to recognize that we can't depend on outside saviors either. And in this, I want to make reference to actually uh, some of Chris Old's research, which he circulated with us a few days ago, where I think he pointed out quite interestingly that there was a lot of negotiation by the various foreign universities and the Singapore government in defining academic freedom. Well, it's good for them. I mean, it makes their stakeholders happy, but frankly, it's got nothing to do with those of us who actually actively research and teach on a day-to-day -day basis in Singapore, because whatever bargain, you know, 
Yale and US strikes at the Singapore government is really not, I, I would say, not that terribly relevant for those of us outside mm -hmm. of it, you know. So in, in the end, it, it's up to, unfortunately, each one of us to try to look for the areas where we think we can actually push a bit on the boundaries and actually see where that goes. And of course, this is a decision that everybody, you know, has to make, um, I would say, uh, in a way that I think is I think one has to be aware of what your own career constraints are, your own professional constraints are, as well as your sense of what is actually in the so-called social and national interest, right? I mean, of course, you know, I, I guess I can't say this claiming to, to have a firm pulse on what is really important to Singapore or not, but it's just something you test one, I think, one step at a time. Uh, that's the only way to go about it. But I would also say that if we happen to be lucky enough to be in, or, or unlucky enough, right, to be in positions of faculty leadership, then it becomes even more important uh, because then, you know, you have to, you have to really ask yourself, I think, on a cont continual, continual basis, which battles are really worth fighting, right? Because there are going to be some battles that are just not worth fighting because the marginal gain to uh, society is a large and academic freedom is really, really tiny. And yet it's going to piss a lot of people off. And there are others where there is an important principle at stake because, you know, here is good scholarship or here is an important point that the public needs to be aware of and it needs to be back to the hilt. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I can't claim to, to make that decision for people, but it's something I hope people would, would keep in mind, you know, as they, as they negotiate these decisions. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Walter. Can we now move on to Chris? Hi, Chris. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, I'll just move that out of the way. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate the, a chance to contribute. Um, and what I thought I would do is just uh, emphasize a few uh, aspects about the broader global context uh, in which uh, debates are happening uh, about academic freedom in Singapore, but also uh, in so many other countries, uh, higher education uh, systems and so on. And so I have a, a sort of four main comments to make. Uh, and the first really is that I think this is, and I'll talk a, a bit about the report again in context as well, not just academic freedom, but I think it's a really um, timely report, uh, regardless of your standpoint about academic freedom debates. Um, they're raging uh, and uh, smoldering uh, in so many other countries and systems uh, around the world. Um, I moved uh, a long time ago from Singapore, which I loved working in, uh, to UW-Madison in Wisconsin. Um, and every single year, there has been very vigorous, vibrant debates uh, about academic freedom and contests about how it's defined, how it's realized, uh, the rights of faculty to do particular things with respect to their research or even make informed commentary. Uh, for example, a very famous environmental historian, William Cronin, wrote a reflective piece in the New York Times about the changing nature of the politics of Wisconsin set in broader historical context, and he was immediately attacked uh, by some politicians and think tanks. And this was a turmoil that went on for a number of uh, years. You think about Hungary, Prime Minister of Hungary forcing Central European University out, intertwined though with issues around George Soros, of course, and now they're bringing in uh, Fudan University uh, from China. Um, it's also intertwined with debates about autonomy. Uh, and I know uh, there has been pushes to have greater autonomy for universities in Singapore over the last couple of decades. The World Bank, with respect to its advancement of ideas of building world-class university systems has emphasized as well um, that uh, there has to be greater autonomy for universities to build these so-called uh, world-class university systems. The European University Association has an autonomy scoreboard that attempts to define autonomy and think about autonomy on a number of levels, including uh, academic freedom and turmoils, again, in the U.S., most recently about critical race theory, uh, for example, um, and some of the tenure and promotion issues and so on. So I think it's an important time uh, and a timely report. Second, and I'm going to just project here, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to... <clears throat> uh, can you see uh, the map that I put up? Okay, so I, of course, a geographer, I uh, had to put up a map. Um, and this is a map uh, that basically was created using uh, Siebert data, which is done, uh, they do a lot of work with respect to um, 
branch campuses. And, and so this is an important report because Singapore is an important, not just national, but international or global higher education space. This is a, a map of branch campuses uh, and only behind UAE uh, and Doha uh, if the education city is sort of right up there. And I, I think what happens uh, with respect to Singapore, but also academic freedom in Singapore, it matters to people around the world, right? It is a key producer of knowledge, uh, both independently and via co-authorship, which is rising around the world. And international co-authorship is rising around the world by design by many governments. And so what happens in Singapore matters with respect to the production of knowledge. It's important to have a very vibrant and vigorous higher education system in Singapore. Uh, there was a recent uh, report flying around. I haven't looked at the details, but they noted East Asia, for example, produces one third of global economic output, yet economists based in the region contribute less than 5% of the articles in major journals. I don't know how, again, accurate that is. I'm assuming East Asia usually is defined to include Southeast Asia, but it's an important right place to produce knowledge. And so what happens with respect to academic freedom matters to people around the world. It's a hub, a major, as was noted, importer of academic labor. Um, and it's an experimental space with respect to the governance of higher education, including some innovative initiatives like the CREATE initiative that was backed by the National Research Foundation of creating a complex and bringing together different universities and trying to get them partnering with other local universities. And so it, Singapore is a yes, national system, but it is globalized by design. Uh, now with Singaporeans firmly uh, in charge of guiding these relationships, uh, sometimes bankrolling and funding them uh, for good and for bad, but it matters. It's integrated into the global system. And so therefore what matters in Singapore with respect to academic freedom, what happens matters to people outside. And so you can't sort of take aspects of the globalization process and like some and not like others. Uh, what happens with respect to academic freedom is an open debate because you are so much integrated into the rest of the world. Um, and I would also say, with respect to my third comment, I think the report is a very strong and indeed, in some ways, path-breaking one on a number of levels. Uh, you can we can have those debates about uh, re, uh, sample return size, but there has was as was noted by Prof. Pang, uh, I think uh, relatively uh, little formalized engagement with respect to the topic. Um, it was good to see, actually, I think the praise uh, incorporated uh, about the system into the report. Um, interesting discussion about gender in the report, which we haven't talked about yet, but what, which we probably should. Um, it, I think it was attendant very well to the politicization of higher education. Again, a phenomena that is evident in systems around the world. Um, and it made reference to some of the more influential uh, international norms and initiatives that helped frame the study. Um, it was interesting to see, just uh, further to Walter's sort of comment, uh, the very, at the very start of the report, the reference to UNESCO. Uh, when I moved to Singapore in, in uh, 1997, I was asked uh, by somebody to, make, uh, to, to, to comment, should UNESCO ever contact me? And I thought that was sort of strange. I couldn't figure out what the politics were at the time. I had no idea. Um, and so UNESCO was obviously involved in some of these academic freedoms back there in 1997 when I moved to UNESCO. Ironically, 10 years later, I was giving a keynote to the International Association of Universities convening of associations of universities around the world, regional associations, national associations. They all got together 10 years later and they created a proclamation that UNESCO was a non-useful international organization. They mm -hmm. thought it was not effective. It had no teeth. It was in some ways non-useful. And so it was kind of funny to compare that to concern about UNESCO when I would move to Singapore to all the associations who are basically saying UNESCO is a non-useful international uh, organization. Uh, and so on. So I think it's a, an, an important uh, report on a number of levels, and I've just flagged a couple of things. I will, though, flag a couple of, I think, interesting sort of points that stand out in absences. Um, first of all, uh, as uh, Walter mentioned, um, by all those, and there was a question about the foreign universities in Singapore and whether or not their presence matters, shapes academic freedom. Um, 
all there's basically um, it's a series of bilateral negotiations between all of the foreign universities that come in, the ones that are still there, the ones that have left, and the state. Um, and right, and you've got ministers, you've got the EDB, etc. And they form formalized sometimes and sometimes informal understandings and negotiations about academic freedom. Sometimes it's just a handshake. Uh, it's a common understanding between leadership. Uh, for example, INSEAD made it clear, and they allowed me to say this, that they'll get in trouble if they got involved in local politics, right? Issues related to race, ethnicity, and they disturb the neighbors and the relationship between Singapore and its neighbors in Southeast Asia. Uh, but they, of course, don't care for the most part because of what they do their research on, right? They are very much in this case interested in sort of a more institutional political economy perspective on the nature of state, society, economy relations, firms, and how they operate and so on. So it also, academic freedom, this is my second sort of aspect of comment four, can be cur curtailed, constrained, and contested via many less political mechanisms and drives and initiatives. The report did a good job on talking about aspects of the politics, but academic freedom can be very much right shaped by bibliometrics, the chase for rankings, and it's sort of hinted and implied there. There are questions about whether or not, in fact, high academic salaries are a constraint on academic freedom, right? Are people willing to put up with more uh, and to acquiesce when they're paid very, very well. And so this is an open discussion, uh, I think that's worth sort of having uh, in relationship to the nature of the Singaporean system, especially with respect to the foreign faculty who are hired and brought in. There's a variety of ed tech aspects. And then most recently, academic freedom, which was referenced with respect to teaching is not just about what you teach, but how you teach. And there's a raging debate in many countries right now about the modality of teaching and how you teach in the context of COVID. Um, and it is a huge debate. Uh, and there's aspects of freedom and with, with respect to pedagogy and teaching modality. Um, a couple of uh, standouts for me, uh, reading the report, the role of heads of departments and deans in acting as uh, the agents of the state when academic freedom uh, is being curtailed. Uh, the need, as Linda mentioned, to get approvals to bring in guest speakers uh, to events, classes to engage with civil society. Um, if the objective is learning, learning outcomes, you have a different frame. If the objective is protection of, right, perhaps reputation of particular uh, people or institutions, you have a different frame. So a learning outcome framed agenda uh, uh, leads to different understandings of this, the opaque and hierarchical structure of the tenure and promotion system. And then finally, um, the, uh, the lack of, I would say, formal, uh, and I'll move to my second slide, formal and informal sort of statements, guidelines, perhaps with respect to faculty manuals, faculty guidelines, tenure contracts, uh, et cetera, uh, criteria associated with tenure and promotion. Um, and even some of the symbolic things uh, that you see on campus. Um, when I walk into my central administration building and I'm a part-time administrator uh, in the building, I walk by every time I enter this plaque uh, and it was the product of a contest about academic freedom. Eventually, uh, this faculty member was protected. He founded the American Economic Association or Association of Economics. Uh, and in association, they basically made a statement. They materialized it with respect to this plaque, which is impossible to remove, I would say, unless you blast it out off the side of our central admin building and you walk by and you sort of in some ways find some stability with respect to how you think about things. It's there, it's spoken about, it's referenced, it's a statement. And so I would ask sort of the question about what sort of, how might we think about, you know, where, presence and absence about these types of things and contracts on campuses and so on. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, since we're running short on time, uh, perhaps we'll move on to the, the people who conducted the survey and whether they would like to respond to some of these questions that were raised by the panelists. 
Hi, Eng Fong. Actually, we have a couple of questions um, from the audience, and maybe we can take one of those questions, two of those questions yes. first. Yeah, okay. before we, we move on to maybe more methodological questions. So we have two questions here that kind of related. They're both about rankings. So the first mm -hmm. question is, given that our local universities are performing very well in university rankings, regardless of our poor standing in academic freedom, should we really care about academic freedom? So that's the first question. The second kind of nuance is this, uh, the concept of rankings. And it asks, should discussions about academic freedom also be guided by the context that Singapore universities are dominantly driven by aspirations of excelling at the rankings, QS? If, for instance, something is seen as cutting edge research because it's likely to drive citations and attract funding, would those areas be more free? And, and the, the asker links us back to Walter's point about the importance of academics to interact with other stakeholders in order not to be so self-serving. It may also be that doing so is costly. So maybe um, the panelists would like to respond um, to these two questions about rankings. Yes. <clears throat> Chris mentioned that, uh, can, I, can I just say something on ranking? Chris mentioned that uh, only 5% of the articles appearing in top journals are from Asian sources. Uh, that's partly because of this, uh, for most countries in the region, there is not that particular hang up or chase for rankings. Singapore is the clear exception. And it does raise the, the status of Singapore academia, Singapore academic institution internationally. Uh, and, uh, and anyone who is in that track and who wants to get uh, improve, uh, advance their career would naturally gravitate towards publishing stuff that would be acceptable to journals which are largely dominated by the, uh, by the North Americans. So uh, rankings, yes, it pleases, I think it, 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 it gives great satisfaction I think, to the public authorities. But it also is, there's a risk that a lot of things which have to be done locally will not get published in those journals and therefore not very useful to the individual academics. So, uh, but also teaching, teaching is not terribly important by, by, as a result for not many of the academics or research tracks. Yes, go ahead, Lina. Yeah, no, I agree. I think one has to make a distinction between global rankings and the national uh, role of uh, universities in both research and teaching. So one of the trade-offs, as Eng Fong has mentioned, is you know these rankings are kind of like a game. Okay? And we know we we uh, you know in sort of ranked universities like mine, you know we 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 uh, coach young faculty like on how to do it which journals you should aspire to. They go to their journal, you see what's an editorial board, you read all the stuff, you figure out how to get it in there. Okay? Now that's possibly okay. Uh, I have my, my doubts, but that's possibly okay in a very large uh, ecosystem like say the United States, right? You, so you can have a few 20, even 200 universities playing that game, but that's because there's a lot of others as well um, that uh, have slightly different uh, metrics. Liberal arts colleges, for example, where I taught uh, for three years uh, at one of the best, Walt Wall, um, emphasize undergraduate teaching. Right? And many of the graduates, many of my former students are now like senior professors all over the place, right? The, the institution itself may not be very highly ranked on research, but it generates people who do produce you know, research. I think it's very different in a place like Singapore. If you look even at the survey uh, that we did, right? Over, what was it? 45% of the respondents were foreign. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, nationals or residents, I forget what. So we are very good at being like a multinational, right? But a multinational uh, and an in, a multinational that ex excels in an industry, let's say Google, or Facebook or something, it's not the same as the country where it's located, right? And the country where it's located may have different needs. For example, if you do research in Singapore, it's very hard to get published in the American Economic uh, Review unless you are doing a topic that's of interest and you can do comparative and you can add to the theory that the American Economic Review or the American Economic Establishment considers important. But your issues might be somewhat different, number one. Number two, we have huge data constraints, 
right, in Singapore, as, as came out in the survey, that is people do not, we don't have access to the kinds of data you do elsewhere. So there's a real risk of Singapore qua nation, as opposed to Singapore as a host for multinational corporations, including the National University of Singapore and NTU, right? It's very different from that. And Singapore uh, as a nation has a lot more different needs, including research needs and teaching needs that ranking actually disincentivize us from following. From following. That's yeah. it. See, when, when, Linda, when Linda and I wrote this piece uh, questioning our uh, preoccupation with rankings, I had some comments of, uh, from, from SMU. Uh, they saw this in, as an anti-foreign position to take because they were playing this game very well and they didn't want a different orientation or more balanced orientation in terms of research. But it was interpreted that way by some people. Okay. Uh, uh, do we have time for more, a couple of more questions or should we listen to uh, hear uh, <clears throat> Sharon? Yeah, yeah, we have about 10 minutes and then we have a couple of questions coming in. I think one group of questions is more methodological and looks at follow up, you know, what okay. can be done after the survey. But we do have a couple of questions um, directed the panelists, at the yeah. panelists. So one person says, as mentioned by Chris, um, salaries of faculty have a negative impact on academic freedom, given that Singapore pays its faculty rather well. Could this explain the poor response to the survey? Um, and the person has as a guess that faculty do not want to jeopardize their pocket. And then we also have a question from um, Dr. Paul Tambaya. And he asked, is the government concerned about being blindsided by the lack of independent and often uncomfortable research on local situations, local politics, and relations with our neighbors? I just may, maybe make a comment. Um, I was uh, just speculating, raising this as a possible cause, um, not necessarily as a cause. Um, just with respect to, there are many different things that shape right, a sense uh, of academic freedom. Uh, like I mentioned, it could be related to tenure and promotion criteria. It can be related to the ways that departments are run. Um, it can be related to associations of faculty um, and how they come in and protect somebody. Salaries are relatively well uh, high in Singapore, and it is, a, I guess, a legitimate question. Um, I don't have an answer. I'm posing it as a, as a possible question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I? Am I on? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that. Um, the salary issue is a very interesting one. I think particularly in our constituency that we send the survey to for social sciences and humanities and so on. I remember it was a long time ago, already 20 years ago, when people would say, you know, as an English lit professor, wherever would you get, you know, made $100,000? Now it's like, if you're a <laughs> philosophy professor, where else would you make $200,000 a year in the world, right? I mean, for some people, it's a question, it's a choice between 200,000 and zero. It's not between 200,000 and 150. So I am on the one hand sympathetic, and I think that leads to one of the, the complaints that's often made, and it's not an anti-foreign uh, uh, complaint, but it's saying that foreigners, and it came on the, in the survey as well, is that foreigners partly because they're they have this visa thing hanging over them um, and are much less inclined to be interested in doing research in Singapore. One, you cannot get published internationally, so you cannot get a ticket out of the place. Um, two, you're much greater risk. Uh, three, your opportunity cost is different, right? I mean, you, you particularly in the humanities social sciences, you don't have very good um, opportunities elsewhere either. And so I do think that all those things combined for every particular individual, it's different, does make a difference. That doesn't mean that the individual is, whether foreign or local, is not in favor of um, academic freedom as a sort of abstract concept and doesn't try to practice it. But we have to be very practical here, you know, you spend eight years getting a PhD in literature or something like that, and where do you go uh, from there? 
And I think what that had, whereas you could say that in the US, well, okay, I don't get tenure here, or I don't, first of all, I wouldn't get my, my visa taken away, uh, you know, but there are many other places, many other opportunities that you can have <coughs> that are totally not state controlled. I think it's not just external actors that we can in Singapore, it is the state, right? And the state, it is somewhat opaque and you're an outsider, you're not supposed to be involved uh, in the state and so on. So it's might as well just, you know, focus and just focus on your, your uh, little thing. So it's a long way around to answer the questions, um, but I think, yes, I think one cannot discard, discount the impact of all these individual calculations on the overall environment and particularly what Walter said of apathy. Walter identified mm -hmm. apathy mm -hmm. and self-interest, right, as the key uh, uh, hurdles to full attainment of academic freedom or even contestation uh, with, with uh, academic freedom. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Linda. So shall we move to um, Sharon to answer some of the methodological questions? And since we only have a few minutes left, Okay, uh, well, yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Fong. I wasn't actually planning to speak up, but uh, this is the third but time Fong so mentioned us, so, <laughs> so, so I can't say no. I'm gonna, uh, some of the methodological questions actually be answered through the text, uh, because mm -hmm. I think there are a couple of perhaps more important points uh, uh, to, to address. First of all, let me thank um, uh, all the panelists uh, for, for you know, I've, I've learned so much in the last uh, hours, but thank you very much for, uh, for building on um, you know, our, our survey findings and raising some really, really uh, important points to think about. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just uh, pick up on a couple of uh, two or three questions that uh, asked, you know, what are our next steps? I mean, we really see this report as a conversation opener. And I think uh, mm -hmm. what Walter said about you know how um, the the community that one would think stands most to gain from greater academic freedom, which is academics themselves, uh, seem extraordinarily unengaged in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going to take some time before um, uh, you know we reach that stage that uh, you know that uh, Walter is advocating, where there is a, a rich conversation about this, so that we understand our norms and can. Uh, you know, negotiate uh, this, this, this complex terrain. And I agree it's complex for a number of reasons. As uh, uh, number one, as, as, as Walter pointed out, uh, it is not as if um, uh, academics uh, have some kind of monopoly on wisdom on how academics should behave. We should, we are, uh, and should always remind ourselves that we are uh, an, an open profession, you know, academic freedom is not for us. Academic freedom is for society. And, and society does have a legitimate seat at the table when uh, discussing what we do. Uh, but perhaps the only um, uh, caveat I would put to that is that while I would agree with Walter that, um, that uh, yes, we must uh, be humble enough to listen to other points of view. I think what uh, many of the respondents uh, seem to be suggesting is that they're not being, they're not only being exposed to other opinions about what they should do. It goes much more than that. You know, these are down to threats and uh, downright coercion. Uh, I would agree with you that I've not seen any violence and I'm kind of surprised by that finding, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, um, but yeah, so, so that uh, has to do with keeping the conversation open. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the end of our report, you'll see uh, a section called lingering questions uh, mm -hmm. that we think are important uh, for the community to, uh, to discuss. One of them um, uh, is, uh, relates very well to what uh, Chris pointed out that, you know, it, it is not simply a case of external actors in the form of politicians and governments imposing themselves on higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what goes on in, in uh, higher education and research has been internalized uh, through yes. the role of metrics and rankings and so on. Uh, so uh, academics need to start with ourselves. How, have, how are we deeply implicated in our own subjugation and the, the, the neutralizing <laughs> of what we do, right? It has to start with that. Um, and Singapore is, by the way, a great place to, to, 
to study it and probably even more than many other places. Um, uh, it was also highlighted that, you know, a surprising finding to me at least was that academic freedom is a gender issue that the gender difference was even greater than say differences in tenure or nationality or race in, in uh, people's perception or in academics perception of uh, how much uh, freedom they get. And, and we have, frankly have no idea why. And I hope, I do hope someone uh, will take this on and study it because it seems extremely important um, that uh, it, what it suggests that is that uh, while uh, I think there is a consensus in Singapore and within universities that um, we need a more gender diverse academic community, uh, this survey suggests that we're not going to achieve it uh, without greater academic freedom, because without it, you'll find uh, women disproportionately uh, affected by the lack of academic freedom. We may have a situation where women um, well, we're not going to have a situation where women are not only seen, but also heard without more academic freedom. And that seems to be what the survey is suggesting. Um, the, uh, the, the point that uh, Linda raised earlier, I think extremely important as well, uh, that even though um, the, the total number of uh, respondents who uh, claim to have uh, experienced, uh, you know, uh, uh, restrictions on academic freedom, uh, you know, they're not the majority, they're, they're not uh, an alarmingly large figure, but we shouldn't be too sanguine about that because the key point to note is that, uh, you know, the experience of um, non-freedom uh, is not distributed randomly, uh, it is systematic. Uh, it affects research topics perceived to be politically sensitive, uh, mostly concerning Singapore society uh, and activities that bridge the gap between the ivory tower and the wider public. Uh, and I think the cumulative effect uh, of, um, which I think all the speakers talked about, you know, of, of uh, systematically disincentivizing critical research uh, on precisely the issues where we may need um, the uh, you know conventional wisdom challenged uh, on Singaporean matters. Uh, you know what, what is that doing to our society's ability to uh, to, to think through complex problems that uh, we are facing? Um, yeah. So so finally, I'll return to to the, the first point I raised. I mean that the reason why we wanted a panel that uh, is not uh, you know you're not listening to the authors of the report but rather commentators of the report is precisely because we want to see this as the start of a conversation uh, and and so thanks for uh, to, to all the panelists for getting us off to a great start thanks Jaren. can i can i make a brief uh, comment on the bertrand russell mathematician philosopher and activist was once asked, would you die for your beliefs? And he said, no. And he was then asked, why not? <clears throat> why? And Bertrand Russell said, I could be wrong. And uh, it's an healthy approach, I think, if we're going to develop the kind of relationship among all the key stakeholders in preserving, enhancing academic freedom. Because, you know, academics have done lousy research and governments have made bad decisions too with respect to creating this community in which there's a lot of trust. And that's where we need to go, trusting each other that we are both doing it for, in the best interest of ourselves as well as of society. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof Pang, and to all the panelists today um, for being here with us. Um, we had quite a few more questions coming in, but I'm afraid it's we are, we are already past time and we won't be able to get to all of them. But I think I echo what Charian said that you know we hope that this report will be an opening invitation for more of these discussions to come. Um, and I'm going to send everyone a link to download a copy of the report. Um, but yes, thank you everyone so much for joining us here tonight, particularly to the four panelists and moderators for spending time with us and really um, giving really rich, detailed and constructive comments um, about the survey. We hope to see all of you again at our future events. Thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank you, Corey.